Okay, in the previous lecture we learned about a uh, transformer and uh, I promised to talk about uh, GPT and BERT to transformer based model. Before actually I do this, I want to correct something. Um, in, in the previous lecture, I, when I was talking about uh, position embedding, I tried to make some sort of analogy between position embedding and one hot vectors. Uh, and I showed you this picture. Then I realized that if you make analogy between uh, position embedding and uh, binary encoding, that makes much more sense and possibly the intuition of uh, you know those who made position embedding this way. I, I told you position embedding is not unique. You know, you can learn position and you can encode it in many different ways. But the way that it was introduced originally, I think it's more uh, aligned with intuition of binary encoding. You know, suppose that you uh, write binary numbers. If you write binary numbers, you know, it's gonna be like uh, zero and then one and then it's gonna be two and then three, right? And uh, four. If if you look at these, you know the frequency of changing. Uh, you can see it is zero one zero one zero one, and then you have two zero two one two zero. You know the frequency would be less. And then you have four zero four ones. The frequency will be even less. You know, if you compare it with uh, these two functions that we had here. You know, we had these two functions, a sine function and cosine function. And if you look at the uh, cosine function for position zero, look at the frequency. And this is for uh, sine. Okay. This is at i equal to zero, so the first element of the vector. Compared with i equal to 50, then the frequency is way less. Okay, so basically you have a sine function to capture out, uh, uh, even position and cosine function to capture the out position and uh, or the other way around, and then you design a function in a way that when you increase the i, the element of the vector, the frequency is less. So the, you know, instead of going 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, you go 2, 0, 2, 1, 2, uh, 4, 0, 4, 1. Uh, here is, you know, just, I made this image of these binary values, say for example from 0 to 100, and you can see that you know, if the first entry changes rapidly, the second entry changes less and less and less. That's exactly what has been mimicked in these two functions, sine and cosine, and to have sort of a continuous version of. So I will correct myself. I said it's sort of continuous version of one hot. It's continuous version of binary coding, uh, what we have in position M. <coughs> okay. So um, then BERT and GPT are both transformer-based models. And I mentioned the uh, other day that uh, you know, in, in we learned that in transformer, we have encoder and we have decoder, right? And uh, roughly, you can say that BERT is a stack of encoders, the first one. And GPT is a stack of decoders, OK? Both of them introduced in 2018. That's the original paper that GPT was introduced in, and GPT stands for Generative Pre-trained Transform. Um, a model to generate sentences, you know, uh, human-like sentences. Baird also introduced in 2018 GPT by OpenAI and BERT by Google. And uh, 
this is basically to find embedding or uh, you know representation of words or the whole sentence okay that's for a different purpose okay let's start with Bert Bert is basically nothing except that you stack some of these encoders together you know and uh, we had six of these encoders in transformer and we had eight heads right multi head so in instead of this you have way more instead of six of them you have more than that and um, so how we are, how are we going to use this basically we are going to uh, train this you know suppose that I have many of these encoders many of these uh, uh, encoders is stacked together now what's the purpose or what's the goal or how I can train it how can I use it the way that I'm going to train it is to mask some words in a sentence pass it through this encoder and ask the last layer to predict it okay so the encoder by itself was producing a representation which we will pass it to decoder. But I'm going to use this representation now to predict a word. And that word is the word that I masked. So um, I would say this word is masked, is a portrait by Leonardo da Vinci. Now I want the, uh, my model to predict it, you know. I have the grand truth. I pass it through and it's at the representation for each you know I have representation for each word uh, for the one which has been masked I want the representation to be representation that if I pass it through uh, you know uh, make a representation basically make a, a distribution out of that pass it through uh, soft max and uh, compared with the, my vocabulary the most likely is Mona okay and then I, pre I, I mask another word Mona Lisa is a I mask this and then I pass it through and I want the model to predict portrait okay so we do it over and over and over on a huge amount of data so eventually, uh, the hope is that when you pass a sentence to, then the representation of this words are good representation, and if you mask, you know, it can predict. Uh, Bert actually does a, another a second job as well in, in the training, I mean. Not that it has been designed for, but in the training besides in the original Bert. Besides predicting a word, it, is, it does a second job, and this second job is predicting that a sentence is the next, this sentence B uh, comes after A or not. You know, two sentences follow each other or not. There are some studies showing that this second task doesn't have uh, a significant role in the training. I mean, if you drop it, the, the performance of BERT would be almost the same. Or, exactly the same I don't know there are some uh, studies which shows the second task is not really quite important a task in terms of the train um, so we can see that BERT is bi-directional in a sense that when I have a sentence and in this sentence I mask a word you know I have a sentence and I mask one word here. Basically, I'm computing the probability of um, I'm computing the probability of this token given any token after and any token before. So in this sense, it's bidirectional. So I I want to I, I need to know all the words that are surrounding this mask. 
okay. Um, so it conditions on left and right buffs. So it can be used if in, in many applications, you know. Um, basically, you can fine-tune, I mean, it's pre-trained, you don't need to train it anymore. This is a relatively new concept that we have models that are pre-trained, right? So we cannot afford to train a BERT, you know, it needs lots of computation that we don't, right? But it is pre-trained. The, 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 the code is, uh, I mean, the weights are there, and you can grab the, the BERT out of the box and use it in an application. How can you use it in an application? By just fine-tuning it and adding more layers to this. You, you have a, a classification task, for example, and you want to do sentiment analysis, for example. This sentence, this review is positive or this review is negative, okay? So BERT can make representation of words. BERT can make representation of the whole sentence as well. You know, I didn't tell you about this. You know, there is this token. It's called CLS in the BERT. It's the beginning of each, when you, when you pass a sentence for each word, there is a representation. But there is an additional token. It's called CLS. And this additional token is a representation of the whole sentence, not just one word. Okay? So you have a vector representation, which is a representation of the whole word. And you may wonder how CLS is a representation of the whole sentence because everything that we explained so far is based on masking. You know, we are masking one word and then pass it through and we want the model to predict that particular word. So how come there is one token that represents the whole sentence? But if you think of the process of transformer, all of the tokens have some sort of information of conjugations and compositions and, you know, the relation of these words all together. Uh, at the end of the day, I want this particular token, which has the information of everything else, represent a particular word, but I don't make this requirement for CLS. CLS is a free token here which doesn't need to represent a single word, you know. It has the information of all of these aggregations and compositions, but it does not need to represent a single word. And then I can fine-tune it, you know. I can add a layer to this, use this CLS for classification. My task is sentiment analysis, and some of the reviews are positive, some of the reviews are negative. My BERT is pre-trained, I don't touch it. I add one more layer to it, pass the CLS of my BERT to this one layer, and then if the review is positive, make it positive. If the review is negative, you know, assign the negative sign. I can, if I want to do better, I can fine tune the BERT as well, you know, change the, the baits of the BERT, not from a scratch. So in this case, what will be impacted the most would be this token CLS, you know, it will be trained in a way that has to do with positiveness and negativeness, but not really necessary in many tasks. <coughs> okay, so uh, to uh, recap, BERT is stack of encoders. The way that we train it is unsupervised, you know, we have a whole bunch of text, we mask portion of the task, pass it through, want the model to predict it. So this is pre-trained BERT. BERT has a CLS token as well, which is a representation of the whole sentence. And you can use it in many applications by adding more layers to this and fine tuning or just tune the additional layers that you have added. Um, <clears throat> any question? Yes. As, as I told you, you know, I, I was trying actually to explain this intuitively that you have many tokens and these tokens are representative of a word, you know. 
but all of them has information about compositions and aggregations and relations, right? But eventually, you know, this, this vector, which has this information, you want it to be representative of a single word, you know, to be similar to this, this vector. But you, you leave CLS free. CLS goes through all of these aggregations, goes through all of these compositions, attend to everything, you know, all, all of these layers. End of the word, end of the day, it does not need, it does not require to represent a single word, you know, you don't want it to. But it, it has all of this aggregation and information because it attended to everything, you know, it attended to all words. No, no, not that it's empty, you know, it could be initial value. What I want to say is that potentially, potentially any, even representation of any word, potentially, is a representation of the whole sentence as well, right? But it's not free, you, you, you assign it to this particular word. But potentially, any of this has sort of aggregation of the whole information. Because, you know, suppose that the, you have the word bank, for example, right? It's not a fixed representation. So if you pass uh, the sentence, um, I went to bank to cash my check. So you have a vector representation for bank. If you pass another sentence, which is, uh, we walked to the bank of the river, for example, it has a completely different representation because the bank has completely different <coughs> meaning. What I'm saying is that if you just look at the representation of bank, potentially it has information of the whole sentence because it attended to everything. Right? Potentially, you can use that token for sentiment analysis. But it's not a free token, you know, it's assigned to this particular word, potentially has information of the whole sentence. But there is, we leave one token free, which is similar to other ones, you know, in terms of the training, it, it attends to everything, you know, gather the information of composition and so on. But it's reserved for this purpose. But if you don't have it, potentially you can use any of those tokens as well. Oh, some aggregations. Yeah, some aggregations, yeah, definitely. Yes? Can you talk loud? Well, you know how the model works, you know? There's nothing magical going on here. The way that the model works is just based on, you know, comparing, you know, tokens to each other, taking some average, weighted average, make a new representation, going to the next layer, do the same thing. So in, in fact, in the first layer, have a representation of the word, and the next layer have a representation of the combination of two words, and the one after have the representation of the words of the words. Nothing magical going on, you know, that's the only thing that's happening here. If you have enough data, if you have large enough model, then you have enough uh, sentences which comes, you know, in, in this form of that, that, that are sarcastic and has contrast when, with, with another word which is completely serious, eventually the model may learn this through time by seeing many of these examples. Otherwise, it doesn't understand it. 
doesn't realize the distinction. You know, there's, there's nothing magical going on here. I mean, the only thing that happens is just this, you know, uh, the process of, you know, uh, making this compositions, and composition of compositions, and so on. Okay, uh, so there are different uh, birds, uh, many different birds actually. This is the encoder of the transformer. Encoder layer, there are six, and attention heads are eight. Uh, and this is the size of basically the neural network, the fit forward neural network that we have after that. The original bit that was introduced in a step six encoder layer has 12 of them. And uh, the hidden layer in step 512 is 768. And in a step eight attention head, it has 12 attention head. And in total, it has 110 million parameters. Uh, they introduce also another variation, which is called uh, bare to large, and you can see the number of encoder layer and the number of parameters and everything. It has 340 million. There are many, many, many different variations of BERT, and people try to make it smaller, make it larger, you know, make it more efficient, and uh, these are you know, famous one, Roberta, and tiny Bert. You know, these are smaller variations of Bert that they claim that performs as good as Bert in some applications, but they are small. And um, there is this multilingual Bert, which has been trained on 104, 104 different languages, not just English. Something quite interesting is domain-specific BERT. So we are talking about natural language, but there are many different domains that uh, you can treat them, you can treat the role, rules as, as a language, you know. Language of proteins, for example. You have uh, proteins and peptides, you know, you have some vocabulary, and this vocabulary and stuff, vocabulary of language, uh, of English language or French language, your vocabulary is uh, amino acids, right? You have a set of amino acids, and sequence of amino acids make a protein, a peptide. So th there is a language here in a sense that there is some sort of grammar. It's not that you can combine anything with anything. It's not that you can bring any uh, I mean, I sit after another one. It has some rules similar to the rules of language. If I mask, you know, an amino acid and I tell the model that the amino acid before this and after that, or these and that, you know, condition and this, can predict something here, you know. And if I tell the sequence of amino acid that I have observed so far, or this sequence, tell me what the next amino acid supposedly would be. You know, the models, if, if there is some rules involved here, the model's supposed to be predicts the same way that it, it predicts in, in natural language. And this is called uh, BioBERT. BioBERT is a BERT which has been trained on uh, proteins. And it can be used in bioinformatics. In there is also BERTs that has been trained on natural language processing, but on uh, <coughs> some specific domain, so on, on academic papers, for example, or uh, on um, finance, financial models, you know, literature of that. Uh, so these are pretty interesting birds, domain specific birds, uh, especially the first one that has great use in uh, bioinformatics these days. Okay, the next model is GPT. And uh, GPT, as I told you, roughly is a stack of decoder. So BERT was stack of encoder, 
but GPT is a stack of encoders. Okay. The uh, difference, I mean, I say roughly because it's not exactly the decoder that we had in uh, transformer. <coughs> That was the encoder, the, the, sorry, decoder that we had in transformers. So we had this masked multi-head attention, and then we had cross attention, and then we had feedforward neural network. So this cross attention attends to encoder, <coughs> right? <coughs> if I want to make just a stack of all of these decoders, and I do not have encoder, so it doesn't makes sense to have this cross attention layer, you know, cross, I mean, attend to what? It, it attends to encoder, but I don't have encoder anymore. So I don't need to attend to anything here. So get rid of this part, get rid of this cross attention. So you have a decoder, which has a masked multi-head attention, goes to a fit forward. So it doesn't have cross, it doesn't attend to anything in a crass way. <coughs> if you make a decoder of this type and then you stack them together, then that's GPT. Okay. So in this case, we have masked uh, multi-head attention and the difference between masked multi-head attention and multi-head attention was that multi-head attention attends bi-directionally, left and right. But if you remember masked multi-head attention attends only on the left, not to the right, you know, because it wants to predict a word, and to predict a word, I don't, I haven't seen the words which comes on the right, you know. I, has, I said, I am a what? Okay, so I have to predict. If there's many words coming after that, I haven't, I haven't seen them, so we have to uh, attend only to the left. So this is masked. Uh, so GPT is basically uh, uh, just just this decoders stacked together. So uh, <clears throat> as I said, it released in 2018, and uh, it has it had 100. 17 million parameters and 12 layers. Instead of six, which we had in Transformer, it had 12 layers. And it was trained on 7,000 books. That was the data set that it was trained on. So, sorry, I, I forgot to tell you the training process. You know, the training process, you know, the training process in BERT was masking. You know, you have unlabeled text corpus, you mask a word, pass the sentence true, you want the model to predict it. Here, the process of training is to predict the next word. You know, I have a corpus, and I start from the beginning of the corpus, I would say I. So predict the next word. I know the grand truth is M, right? It, it has a distribution over all possible words, and I do back propagation, make the weights in a way that the, the, the probability of M is the maximum. So we predicted M. Now I give I M to the model. And we make it to predict A. Then I add it to the sequence, I give I M A to the model. And I want to predict teacher, for example, right? And, and so on, you know, you always give a sequence and you want the model to predict the next token. That's the way that you train the model, train GPT. <coughs> it was trained on 7,000 unpublished book. Uh, but that was GPT-1 in 2018. GPT-2 in 2019, which way more larger, you know, See, it was 117 million, and GPT-2 was 1 point billion. Much larger model. Um, so the number of layers were 48. And then we had 
GPT-3 in 2020, which had 175 billion parameters, you know, twice the number of neurons that we have in our brain. Um, and GPT-4 is way more than this, you know, we don't know exactly how many parameters, because they, they, they didn't release the information after GPT-3. There are just some uh, speculation that how large GPT-4 uh, is, but no one exactly knows because they haven't released that. So <clears throat> it, it's way more larger model. Uh, I would say that, uh, you know, there was always this understanding and insight that if you make the model larger, it's going to work better, right? Uh, and uh, we have observed in deep network that more layers, better generalization usually. And uh, so if you have, if you make a model, it doesn't work, you know, just, just add one <laughs> layer to it. And if it doesn't work, you add one more layer to it. That, that's what, what our, is our practice in deep network. Right? So it was this understanding that if you make the model larger, it's going to generalize better. But I would say that uh, it's maybe surprising that, uh, I mean, the, the quality that we observe now in these very large models is surprising. At least uh, as, as someone who was involved with GPT from day one and working with the tra training in, uh, for different applications, I was surprised by seeing some of the uh, performance that we can observe now in models like ChatGPT or Llama and so on. And <clears throat> there are areas of research to understand mathematically what's, what's happening inside. You know, because we have these models that, th that they learn by few shot, by one shot, you know, you just show one example and they learn some con new concept. And uh, some of the research are aligned the, line, uh, line, uh, the, 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 the concept of existing linear path inside these large models. You know, this model is quite large, such that for given input and given task, there is a linear path. And the, the reason that it can learn by few shot and one shot is that it, you know eventually the model learned to handle this task through this particular path, which is linear for this particular one, and it can learn it because it's linear. It can learn with one example, two examples, but these are just pretty unmature research in this area. But quite interesting that why we observe such a good performance when these models became so large. It's not just being large because there are models that are larger than GPT-3, but not as good as GPT-3. So there are many other um, factors involved. So this, the speculation is that GPT-4 is about 100 trillion parameters. And uh, one difference between GPT-4 and 3 is that GPT-3 is trained only on text, but GPT-4 is multi-modal, text and uh, images and uh, voice, you know, different type of. <coughs> so another model which is interesting to know about is T5. Um, and that's the original paper for T5. So roughly speaking, T5 is BERT and GPT together, you know. So BERT was just encoder, GPT was just decoder, and you can think of uh, T5 as connecting BERT and GPT together. So you have encoder and you have decoder, okay. Now, uh, <clears throat> but it's not just that, you know, that's in terms of uh, a structure of the model. It's not just that, you know, something interesting that has been done in T5 
is to <coughs> basically um, turn <coughs> many problems in natural language pro processing as, I mean, cast the problem as text-to-text -text problem, you know. We, ha we, are, we have sentiment analysis problem in natural language processing. Sentiment analysis originally is not text-to-text. -text, is text to a label, right? You want to give a text and it tell you positive, negative, right? It's not text-to-text. Um, but you can translate it and you can change it to text to text. How? I can say, okay, uh, it, it is a sequence to sequence or it is a text to text because I give you this sentence and the next token is positive. So if I show you this sentence, predict token positive. And if I show you a different sentence, predict uh, token negative, okay, or tell me it is positive or it is negative. So I can, <coughs> in, in, say for example, in my GPT model that I uh, can basically train a token given the previous token, uh, the, the next token which comes after this particular sentence could be positive or negative. Or translation. Translation between different languages. Say, for example, I have a prompt here. And the prompt is that translate the next sentence from English to French. And there is an English sentence. And uh, coming sentence after that is in French. If I have a corpus of many of these examples, that is start with saying that translate this sentence from English to French. And then it says there is English sentence and there is French one after coming after. So the model eventually learns that the next token that it's supposed to predict is the translation of this English sentence when it has this prompt in front of that. So something interesting that happened in, in, in T5 is that they cast most natural language processing problems as text to text and then they this, the same way that BERT and GPT are pre-trained they pre-train this their model on these tasks on translation on sentiment analysis and so on and so forth so basically you can take T5 out of the shelf and apply to many of these natural language processing task summarization for example summarize this task and so on and um, so the training is a combination of unsupervised and supervised you know the training of BERT is unsupervised right the training of GPT is unsupervised but the, here some of the training are supervised some of the training are unsupervised so it's combination of both so if you want to do sentiment analysis, it is supervised. If you want to do translation, it's supervised. But um, to train the encoder is unsupervised. Train the decoder is unsupervised. So it's a combination of those. And uh, similar training that we have in BERT by masking like 15% of the token. Similar training that we have in GPT by um, masking the rest of the sentence, trying to predict the next token. But also training with summarization, which is supervised, and sentiment analysis, which is supervised, but introducing different uh, prompts. So basically, if you have a T5 model, and if you give the prompt summarize, and then give a, give a text, then the next part would be the summarization of this task, or so on. Any question? This is, uh, if you want to have some sort of idea of the <coughs> you know, the, the number of parameters in the, the, the different models. This is how GPT-3 compares to GPT-1, for example. 
and uh, so basically you can't see GPT-1 or GPT-2 when you have three. And I, I told you that uh, there are models way larger than GPT-3, um, whether they perform better or not, we are not aware if they perform better. I mean, there's not much news about. These are usually created by different companies, and and that's something tragic actually that these days happen. Happen is that the center of research in this area somehow moved from universities to industry because there's no industry, no university in the board which can afford, you know, this number of computer, or this number of GPUs. And um, they, they have it, you know, they can just make their model 100 times larger and they call it GPT-3. <laughs> so, uh, no, I, I, I really don't want to undermine, you know, there for it. It's, it has been a breakthrough. It's not just a larger model. There are many nice engineering going on, but uh, anyway, I mean, you can't do that in, in university easily. And if you compare GPT-4, you can see that the, the, this is the largest model possibly that has been built up today. It's very larger than GPT-3. Okay, I, I had a couple of slides just to demonstrate the, uh, what, what these models can do, but I feel that they might be irrelevant to show them because you're playing with chat GPT every day now, right? And you have seen that, that they can generate text, they can summarize, they can um, fill up the, the spreadsheet, you know, they can write codes. And some of these slides that I have are just to explain these things, which I'm going to skip them um, because you have you have seen them in first hand, actually. Okay. Okay. Any question? Okay, um, there are uh, steps to uh, to take from GPT to something like Chat GPT, you know, because what we said so far about GPT is that GPT is trained in a way to predict the next talk. Right, but you we use Chat GPT every day, and it's way more than that. You know, it gets it, it get engaged with in a conversation with us. You know, we ask a question, and find the answer, uh, argue about it, do reasoning on a particular problem. You know, and uh, write codes debug codes and, and so on and so forth. So it's, it seems that from this point, predicting the next token, up to what we observe as, you know, uh, this conversational models, there are a couple of steps that are, we are missing and we will basically would like to talk about them. So the core challenge with GPT model at the level that we learned so far, uh, <clears throat> is that inherently it doesn't follow instructions. You know, if you want to do it in a conversation, it doesn't follow the instruction of the user. Uh, so if I want to say the model to translate to uh, summarize, to answer this question. We don't have any mechanism to do that. We get some idea that how it can be done when I was explaining T5. Because I told you that in T5, if you have many, if you have a large corpus that 
it starts with translate this sentence from English to French and then follows with some sentences, eventually the model learns. So basically you can do prompt engineering this way and introducing some prompts to the model by introducing a corpus of these prompts and the tasks that you want to be done following that, that prompt and get the model to learn this prompt and follow the instruction of the user. So this is some sort of idea that basically has been done, but we have to talk about it more uh, carefully and, and more precise. Uh, <clears throat> this is not the only thing, you know. There is a, a more general topic that people usually use, and it's called alignment. And you want the model, you want your language model to be aligned with intention of user. And this alignment means that it has to follow the instruction of the user, but it's not only that, you know. So what uh, the, the model generates should be politically correct, right? Should follow some moral principle, you know. It shouldn't be offensive shouldn't say something, you know, uh, which can be interpreted as racism or and so on and so forth. You know, there are many things that basically you have to align your model with some uh, desire of the user, with some moral rules, with some whatever, you know, there, there are set of things that the model should be aligned with. I don't know, have you ever tried to um, jailbreak ChatGPT? Yeah. Did you? What was your experience? <laughs> it, it's quite interesting and it's easy actually to jailbreak ChatGPT and if, if you do so, it's, uh, it's, it's fun to play with. Uh, um, you know, I, I ask, you know, a, famous person, the, the, do you know this person? And the, the answer in the, the normal form was that, of course, you know, he's a great philosopher, teach at the University of Chicago, and uh, has 60 books, and, you know, long article about achievement of this person, and so on. And then I jailbreak and ask the same question, do you know this person? And the answer was that, of course, this old man who say, nonsense all day and uh, who cares about this nonsense <laughs> quite offensive you know so uh, it's it's data you know when you have this corpus of data and you want to n predict the next word given the previous words you have both of these type of things you know you have academic articles about this philosopher and you have comments of his students right in uh, rate my teacher.com you know they don't <laughs> like him and uh, say he says nonsense and uh, you have all of them you can predict all of them and you have to make your model aligned with what you want you know don't want no one get offended for example or say something racist so alignment is quite important <clears throat> and it's um, the, the about many different things, about mainly these four things uh, that uh, basically learn from human feedback. You want it to get engaged in conversation. You know, you say something, it answers something, and then you give some feedback, it should correct it. You know, see that you say GPT, that's not what I meant. and says that I apologize, you know, I ignore this fact. Um, you want to train it to follow instructions. <coughs> and uh, basically, you don't want this to be harmful. And we basically want to focus on this one, training to follow instructions. Many other things would be pretty similar, actually, to do. And uh, <clears throat> this is basically done in um, three steps. So you have a GPT or you have 
a model. You know, I, I, I keep saying GPT because GPT is the name of the model. You know, Chat GPT is built. I mean, Chat GPT is a GPT which has been trained to get involved in conversation and so on. You have other models with, without this name, like for example, Llama, Llama by Facebook. It is GPT based, you know. I mean, this, the, the structure of the model. The architecture of the model is GPT, but it's, the, the name is different. So in this case, or, or BART by uh, Google, you know, which just released in some countries, not here, not in Canada. Uh, <clears throat> so there are three steps after training GPT. You have to take three more steps to, for alignment. And this three steps is supervised fine tuning. And supervised fine tuning, we'll talk about it <clears throat> in more detail, but roughly, it is similar to what I said. You know, you have prompts, and prompts follow by some uh, particular tasks. So basically, <clears throat> with this <clears throat> prompts, you teach the model to follow particular instruction. And uh, the, the two other things that we have here may need some backgrounds that we are lacking. It, it, it has to do with reinforcement learning. So the, the first part is just supervised, but this one is uh, mm, based on reinforcement learning training in particular. It's a technique which is called reinforcement learning from human feedback. So uh, <clears throat> basically, uh, there are Assume that you you created a large data set of feedbacks of people. And then you want to apply reinforcement learning algorithm to make your training better to address these feedbacks, ad ad address the, 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 the rewards that people created. It's happening now as well. You know, you have seen sometimes that in chat GPT, for example, it generates some things and basically can uh, say it's good or bad. You know, sometimes it gives you two options and asks you which one is better. So basically, it, it, it is going to be used in this last part, reinforcement learning from human feedback. But they generated a specific data set with human uh, feedback to, to train the model. So we need to learn a little bit about reinforcement learning before learning about uh, <coughs> reinforcement learning from human feedback and this last part. So I'm going to uh, hold this here, you know. So we learned about transformer BERT GPT. Now we get to the problem that it should be aligned. To do the alignment, we have three steps. The first step is supervised. I have no problem to learn this in details. But then I, we need to know reinforcement learning to understand the next step. So we stop here, go learn a little bit about reinforcement learning, and then come back here. So we are not completely done with large language models. We'll come back to it. But after learning a little bit about reinforcement learning. So we learn about reinforcement learning not only because of uh, reinforcement learning from human feedback for large language models. Also because uh, there is an important field in uh, deep learning is called deep reinforcement learning. And we want to basically know also how deep reinforcement learning works, right? Okay, so... Um, how many of you have taken a course on reinforcement learning before? Okay, how many of you haven't taken a course but know about reinforcement learning other courses? Okay, 